Good afternoon. Hello, and a very warm welcome to this lunch hour lecture. Um, and hello at the same time to our online audience um, watching. Uh, just to say that questions are open uh, uh, to everybody, including those on, watching online. Uh, they might like to know that the Twitter feed for this is at UCL LHL, and the Slido event code is 4536. Um, ah, but for now, I'm very pleased to introduce from the Institute of Education, uh, Joseph Mintz, um, who uh, is presenting his lecture entitled how can 21st century research on autism empower London's teachers? Over to you, Joseph. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, so my name is, is Joseph Mintz, and I'm a senior lecturer at the UCL Institute of Education. And my research interests and work uh, are around special educational needs and inclusion, and I've done significant amount of work around autism education, including the use of technology for uh, use with autism in the classroom, as well as on the professional practice of teachers, and particularly around the knowledge and teacher education, thinking about what is it that teachers need to know to be effective, inclusive teachers, and particularly what is it that we might think that they want, need to know about things like autism and other categories of special educational needs. And this lecture is around a very small project, really, that we did thinking about how we can make research on autism accessible to teachers working in, in mainstream classrooms with children with autism. And it was a collaborative project. So um, I was working with uh, several colleagues, Dr. Chris Brown, um, Dr. Sarah Price at the UCL Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, and my colleague Sarah Selesnev, who's here with us in the audience today, again from UCL IOE. So, autism is something which is very much there in the media, in awareness. It's been growing in awareness ever since. It came up as a diagnosis by Kanna and Asperger in the 1940s. But there's an increasing interest and awareness in it. Whether that means that there's any higher incidence of it or not is a different question. But it's something that everyone is aware of. And it is something about being different, as we can see in the picture. Being different in some way to the typical. And when we think about what autism is, well, we do know quite a bit about what it is. It's something to do with genes. It does have a genetic component. It's something to do with biology, with neurons, with what goes on in the brain. And it's something to do with behavior. And although we talk about autism spectrum disorder, and the spectrum is very important because there's a very wide range of behaviors which, go, which together are called autism. So you hear from people who work with children with autism, well, if, you've know, if you know one child with autism, and you know one child with autism. It's, it's so varied. Nevertheless, having, having said that, there are things that we can see, and the very fact that it is considered a, con a condition, a diagnosable condition, clearly suggests that there are some elements of commonality. And one way of thinking about that is to say that it's to do with, at the cognitive level, issues with mind reading. Um, so, that's about saying, well, if I'm thinking about what someone else is thinking about, particularly what they might be thinking about me, so that's something that we do all the time. Um, so, for example, if you go to a party and you tell a joke and everybody laughs, somewhere in your mind you've got an understanding of why it is that they are laughing at the joke. You don't think about it, it's just there automatically. But you've got this sense of their perspective, and their perspective as being different to yours. And in people with autism, that doesn't happen quite as automatically. Um, now, one of the classic ways that this has been investigated 
is by something called the Sally Ann test, um, which goes back a long way. It goes back to work by Uta Frith uh, here at UCL and uh, Simon Baron Cohen in Cambridge. So what you do is this scenario here, you, are, you show it to a child, and you might do that using a picture or using actual, actual models, uh, little figures to show it. So you've got Sally and Anne. So Sally comes and puts a ball in the basket. She then goes away. While she's away, Anne comes, takes the ball out of the basket, and puts it into the box. <clears throat> so then Sally comes back. Now, you then ask the child, where is Sally going to look for the ball? Okay. Well, you think, well, she's going to look for the ball in the basket, because that's where she left it. So most children will say that. But children with autism, not exclusively, but nevertheless are more likely to say that she'll look for it in the box. Because it's much more difficult for them to put themselves in someone else's shoes see what it might look like from another perspective. Now, the consequences of that, I've got it on the slide as mentalizing difficulty, sometimes referred to as theory of mind difficulty, is that you're going to find it more difficult to do things like understanding sarcasm or jokes. You're going to find it more difficult to relate to people because it's a, although we think people who are neurotypical, that's the phrase that's often used, people who are neurotypical, take these things very much for granted, they're actually central to the way that we relate to each other. So you're going to find it more difficult to engage in friendships. You're going to find, be slower at learning social conventions. And the implications for learning, if that you have these difficulties from a very early age, the way that you will learn about social interactions, about the social world, is similarly going to be limited from that early stage in development. So you're going to miss out on opportunities for social learning and for social communication. So there are implications clearly around that for the classroom. So children with autism will find it difficult to pick up on nonverbal cues. Coming back to the jokes. If you think about telling a joke, often it's very much not just with the words that you come out of your mouth, but it's the way that you say them, your body language, the way that you might wait at a particular point in telling the joke. And all of those things are going to be more difficult for children with autism. Understanding non-literal language. Understanding why somebody has done something. Again, coming back to being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And coping with changes routine. So there are lots of potential issues to say, well, children with autism are going to, are different. Not that necessarily difference is a bad thing, but it is a difference. And in the structured environment of the classroom, which works around particular lines, particular structured lines, having someone who's different may present challenges to teachers in terms of how they can include those children effectively in the life of the classroom. So they might think, might think need things like explicit explanations and instructions, support when things are different, and assistance with social relationships. Now, we talked about issues with, issues with mentalizing, but there are lots of other cognitive theories around autism about how we might think about what autism is. And one of those is called weak central coherence. Um, and again, uh, Uta Frith did quite a bit of work on this and Francis Happe as well. And the idea with weak central coherence as an explanation for autism is to say, well, that people with autism find it difficult <coughs> to see the bigger picture, but that they're very good at focusing on details. So if you show a, a complex picture, they might be able to pick out specific details of, of it that other people may find it harder to do. So in some ways, you can see that actually is a strength. And in some ways, it, it is a strength. So for example, some people with autism can be very good at tasks and jobs which involve specific detail. So for example, software engineering 
often some people with, with autism can be very good at, at software engineering because it requires very close attention to specific detail. But they find it harder to see the bigger picture. So, and also, it also means that sometimes they can get very focused on particular details of the environment. And some people would argue that that is an explanation as to why some people with autism have issues with sensory information. So that they can be oversensitive to sensory stimuli. And it's linked to that idea of focusing too much on detail. So that if things are very noisy, if there's a lot of light, a lot of color, that they can find it difficult to process that and can have a kind of sensory overload which can lead to anxiety. That's another element of autism. Now, so we talked about one, two areas there very briefly. Now, the thing is that that's two very small elements around thinking about what autism is. And this is from uh, a paper that was published um, in 2015. And they were basically looking, well, how many papers, academic papers, have been published around autism? And they were actually only looking at actually a subset of particular types of papers, but nevertheless. So what they're telling us is that in 2014, there were 3,000 academic papers, at least 3,000, probably many more than that, published around autism. There's loads of people in the world, many of them here at UCL, working or in particularly in psychology and in psychiatry and in medicine, writing and doing work and research about autism and publishing papers around it. Well, 3,000 is a lot of papers. I mean, you know, nobody in the world could read 3,000 papers in one year, let alone busy teachers who are working in school. Because what are teachers doing? Teachers are spending their time in school teaching children, and they're very, very busy. They're busy planning lessons, they're busy marking, they're busy thinking about their children. Having said that, they are the people who do the work with children with autism. Most children with autism are in mainstream schools. Like all children in the country, when they're between school and in school age, most of their waking lives is spent in school. The people who are with them, who are doing the work with them, are teachers. These are the people who are most likely to be able to have an impact on their lives. So how can we make a connection? This is what this, this research is about. Between all this academic research and what teachers are doing in the classroom. It's not an easy question to answer. And it links into broader work, thinking about how we can bring research generally into the work that teachers do. Putting it another way, how, could we, how can we make teaching an evidence-informed profession. Okay. So the work that we did, and again, this was a small project, is we did some work around the idea of research learning communities. And this is an existing idea that my colleague Chris Brown at UCL IOE um, initiated, and he's already done quite a, a bit of larger scale work on this, but nothing to do with autism or special needs or inclusion. And it involves having a small group of teachers from a couple of schools coming together and thinking about issues related to teaching and learning and thinking about how research evidence could be used in the work that they're doing. And the idea of this kind of work is to think about work that's evidence-informed not work that's evidence-based. Because we often hear in medicine about evidence-based medicine. Very common phrase. The issue, though, when we're thinking about teaching is that teaching is a very complex environment. It's different to when you break your leg or when somebody creates a new antibiotic. When you create a new antibiotic, you go out, you do a randomized controlled trial, you see, is it effective or is it not effective? You have a paper about it. And that will tell you, well, yes, should you use it or, sh or should you not? That's a bit of a simplification. But nevertheless, that's what we think about when we think about evidence base. There's a clear evidence base that will tell us what it is that we need to do. And that works well for science. It works well, in general, for medicine. It doesn't work quite so well for education, because education is about teachers in the classroom. And 
there's different figures that you hear, but you hear these figures that a teacher in the classroom will have 10,000 interactions with, a, with different interactions during the course, I don't know if it's sort of a day or, or a week, whatever it is, it's a lot of interactions. It's very, very complicated what's going on in the classroom because social fields are complicated things. And also autism, coming back to autism, we talked about it being a spectrum. Again, it's a complicated thing. We talk about a huge variety of behaviours that come under this umbrella of autism. It's not a clearly defined, we know bits about it, we have some understanding about it, but our understanding is really quite limited because it's all about behaviour and interaction and how people work socially. These things are too complex for us to have a very clear evidence base. And at the same time, what's important for us to think about is not just what's there in evidence, but what's there in terms of professional experience. Because in the end, the teacher in the classroom is the person who really knows the child. So it's a question of how we can bring that knowledge of the individual child that the teacher is working with together with what we might be able to glean from research. So, what we did was we worked with three schools in Tower Hamlets, Phoenix, which is a Phoenix special school, Bonner Primary and Smithy Street Primary, and we had six teachers. And the way the research learning community works is you have four sessions where you work with them all as a group. So they come out of school, they work as a group over the academic year. And they undertake their own little research project, which is based around thinking, let's come up with a a question, let's investigate what it is that the research and our own professional experience might tell us, let's try something out, let's evaluate it and let's reflect on it. And we focused on two particular areas that were, and this is based on the interests of the teachers, we focused on making positive relationships, as you've seen that's a key area for work with children with autism in the classroom, and dealing with sensory problems. This was related to their particular interest with the children that they were working with in the classroom. So then what did we do in terms of thinking how we could begin to make research evidence accessible to them? So, and again, this is all based on existing work that my colleagues Chris Brown and Sarah Slezov here had already been involved with. So we did the STRIPS activity. So what we do is we build a, we write a research, a literature review, which looks at about 20 20 academic papers and puts it into a narrative that's accessible to the teachers. We don't just give it to them. What we do is we chop it up. So we chop it up into strips, comprehensible strips, comprehensible bites of information. And then we ask the teachers to take that and put it together into groups that make sense to them. And the idea is that, well, if you just give teachers this big literature review, well, you know, are they going to go away and read it? Is it going to be something that's accessible to them? Because teachers are not generally in the habit of spending a lot of time reading research articles. So the idea of this type of approach is that you offer them a way in for them to be able to think about it and think how it relates to their practice. After that, we give them the literature review and ask them to go away and read it. And after that, we ask them to identify perhaps a couple of papers, journal articles, that they might be really interested from that, from that, and then to read those in more detail. The whole idea being, well, this is a one approach of making the research evidence accessible. Now, one of the things that one of the groups picked up on was around sensory-based interventions. So that's essentially where, when you've got children who are having issues with sensory stimulation, that you introduce some activities into their routine which will help them to regulate their sensory input and thus to, to regulate their emo emotions. And those are all to do with things that could be added into the timetable during the day that could be built into what's going on in the classroom. And there's a list here, so it could be things to do with brushing or massaging. And for some children, wearing a heavy vest helps them to feel more integrated that would be things like using sticky, sticky materials as in messy play, for example. And again, it's interesting that of the papers that we sent them, one of them said, well, these sensory-based interventions don't work. Because when you look at the literature around them, 
and you look at the, the quality of the studies that have been done, according to the authors who wrote this review, well, there's not that much very strong evidence about them. And again, that's quite common with autism. It's quite common with most things that we see in education. There isn't often very, very strong evidence saying, yeah, that really, really works, and that really, really doesn't. You don't see it very often in education. But there was another paper which said, well, actually, maybe sometimes it can work for some children with problems, with problems with emotional regulation. So they had these in, in their mind when they were thinking about what they wanted to do in terms of their project. And then, as they were formulating what to do, one of the other things we get them to do is to do a modeling activity. And again, this is a way of them being able to internalize and think about what it is that they want to put into practice and what the research evidence and what their professional practice might mean to them. And this is the outcome of, and it, might, it might look a little childish, but actually it's really effective when you see them do it. And when you ask them about it, they tell you how this helped them to formulate their thinking. And this model here is for one of the children in their classroom. They, was, they were basically showing us at the top, that's how it feels to them. That's how the classroom feels to them. And at the bottom, that's how we'd like it to feel to them. At the top, you can see it's unstructured. It's confusing. It's difficult to understand. Everything feels like a mess. And the question was, how could we make it feel more like a calm, structured, understandable environment where I feel safe? Okay. And this project as well, and the research learning community approach, isn't just about going for change with the individual teachers who are involved, but it's about making a change across their school so that their school as a whole begins to be thinking more about how they could make use of research evidence in their work. So one of the other activities that we do with them is around opinion formers. And we particularly choose for the teachers who are going to be there. We choose one who's a senior leader and one who's a classroom teacher. So that you've got someone who's at the top, but someone who's also part of the work, the uh, chalk face work face, work workforce, so to speak. Now, in schools, you typically think about the head teacher being at the top, there's the king at the top, then you've got the senior leadership team, then you've got all the teachers down the bottom. So, using some elements of social network theory, the research learning community approach suggests, well, actually, what, ten, what actually happens is that opinion formers, people who have an influence on what happens in an organization, can often be at different positions. And it, so it's about who you meet when you're at the water cooler. It's about the conversations that happen in the corridor, not necessarily what it is that you just hear in the staff meeting from the head teacher saying, well, we should do X, Y, and Z. And it's thinking about those kind of networks that can make a difference to actually what goes on in a school. So we ask the teachers as well to do an exercise based on that where they map out networks of influence within their school. And actually, they really like doing that. Um, and from that, we get them to think about how they could, as part of the project, influence what goes on in their school. And some of them who weren't that used to being in the role of opinion former, at least explicitly, went on and were involved with giving presentations about the work that they did to other staff and in staff meetings. And as we'll see, we think that that did lead to change throughout the school. Okay, so coming on to the specifics of what happened. So we had, in one school, two teachers, and they'd had some experience of working with children with autism, but not very much training in it. But this wasn't an area that they knew a huge amount, amount about. And they focused on one child, Richard, who was five years old. And he had these issues with sensory stimulation, with sensory integration, finding it very difficult. And when it didn't work, he would act out. He would get very upset. If, he, if the sensory environment wasn't right for him, he would be everyone would be anxious about stepping in because of the way he would act because of that in the classroom, which is not unusual for children with, for children with autism. So 
what they did was they thought about the baseline. So we start off with getting them to think, well, this, what do you think is going on for this child or group of children that you're working with at the moment? And so they do some initial observations. What they also did was talk to the occupational therapist um, who was consulting for the school around their work with this child. And one of the interesting comments that we got later on when we did interviews with, with the teachers, one of the things that they said was that I felt that we were able to have an informed conversation with the OT, with the occupational therapist, because of the work that we did. We thought that was very interesting because to us that was showing that they were beginning to think, well, as professionals, we can begin to access the evidence that's out there about autism just as much as the specialists who might be coming in and telling us what to do. And they also observed that this child, Richard, he would engage already in some independent self-soothing strategies. And again, that's very common for children with autism linked to, is to sensory issues that they'll self-regulate in some way. So that might be, often you might see flapping activity, tapping activity like that. All actions which are designed to calm themselves down when they're feeling anxious, particularly if that's related to sensory stimulation. And what they decided to do, partly as a result of the, the literature review, partly as a result of their discussions with the occupational therapist, was to try out a sensory timetable for this child. So a sensory timetable involved, going back to the literature we looked at about um, sensory interventions, a variety of things that they added into the timetable at a regular time. And some of those would be for the whole class, and some of those would be for Richard individuals. So it's things like messy play. It would be things like, to term it sensory snacks there. You get the children to help each other self-regulate. So there you can see that they're applying pressure on there, which is a way of, of, um, <clears throat> of um, helping with reg regulation uh, around sensors. And other sensory activities, you can see, the, uh, particularly ones which were to do with uh, oral and, and motor areas, which often can have a, 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 a significant element when we're thinking around sensory stimulation. So those were added in to the timetable um, over a couple of months for this child. And then they assessed the impact of that through getting the child themselves to give a view of what they thought, what, where they were in terms of their emotional state, and the staff as well would make records. And you can see the example of what that looked like there. So at the top, you see what the child was recording, and at the bottom are the comments from the staff working with them, so that they could track through what was happening with that child and then hypothesize about, well, is the, the intervention making a difference? OK, so at the end, when they reported it back to their colleagues, first of all, they identified, which they hadn't seen before, that well, you might think it's obvious, in a way you might think it could be, but clearly it wasn't for them beforehand, that hunger and tiredness had a big effect on Richard's emotional regulation. So that's indicating to, to them that that's something that they need to look out, out for. And interestingly, in the research papers, they looked at, the two that I identified for you, that was also something that was noted there, that that was an, an element that could often have a big impact in terms of how sens sensory issues relate to emotional regulation. But they felt that there were more episodes of him being happy than being distressed, and times of anxiety and distress were less frequent. Now, we need to be cautious in how far we go in interpreting this, but clearly for them, in their own setting, they did feel that this is something that had helped with And they also saw that he was making more attempts at communication. So I probably should have said before, so Richard was nonverbal. That doesn't mean he didn't communicate, and he used pe uh, uh, alternative methods for communication, particularly something called picture uh, exchange communication system, which is a way of well, children with autism who are nonverbal use images and pictures to communicate. But their sense was that he was making more attempts at communication at the end of the intervention and that he seemed perhaps more, a bit happier. So perhaps, perhaps it was the case that, going back to that model picture, that things weren't quite 
as unstructured and scary and anxiety provoking, perhaps they did feel a little bit safer. And then coming back to the idea of this impacting on the school as a whole, the, the school decided to introduce a system of sensory breaks across the school. And that they, the senior leadership felt that this is something that could make a difference. Now, we haven't tracked to go on and see what impact this has had going on into this year, but certainly at that, the end, this is at the end of the project, it did seem that the whole school as a whole had to some extent taken this on board. So, obviously this is a very small project. And it leaves us thinking, well, could this type of, research, could this type of approach really be effective? And clearly what we'd want to do is do some larger scale research um, to do this with a much larger group of schools, uh, perhaps across um, local, a, a local authority or across uh, a multi-academy trust, and really see in a more structured way whether the use of this approach of research learning communities around autism education could make a difference to how teachers work. And there's two elements to that, one of which is what do the teachers feel? Do they feel more confident in engaging with research? Do they feel that they're beginning to be able to think, well, I could go out and independently find out about research that's out there in some way? And do they think it's making a difference actually to the work of the school and the impact that it's having for children with autism in the classroom? So it doesn't answer the big question, which goes back to those two, two images I showed you, one with the graph of the papers and one with the teacher at the board. Perhaps there isn't an answer to this issue of, well, what's the relevance of all this academic knowledge to teachers? Is it even relevant to them at all? And how can we make it accessible to, to them? It doesn't give us an answer to that, but at least it kind of starts us on the journey, particularly around autism education, of thinking how we could explore and find out more about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, and now I um, uh, op open it up for questions. Let me just check. Um, are there questions from... So we'll, have, we'll start off uh, at home. Um, any questions from the floor at the moment? There's one at the back there. Thank you. you alluded to it at the beginning that diagnosis of autism has increased uh, over recent years. Why do you think that is? Um, well, um, I think most, most people working in the field think that it's, it's increased because of increased awareness. So in general, it's something that people are thinking about more, so people who work in education, people who work in health, people who work in social services, it's something that people are more aware of. Um, as well, there has been much more work done on early diagnosis. So we now have, although their implementation is very variable, and I think in England it's particularly variable, um, which is partly related to funding, we, we do now have internationally much better tools which allow us to diagnose autism really potentially from the age of about 18 months and two years. And those tools weren't there, weren't there if we go back 15, 20 years ago. We didn't have them. So I think better diagnostic tools um, increased awareness. But I don't, I, I don't think, and I don't think most people in the field think, that this is anything to do particularly with increased incidence. It's, much just, so it's not that more people have got autism now than had it you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. It's just that we're more aware of it and we're better at finding it out. I'll take the online question uh, just now. Hello. Uh, so two questions from Slido. I guess I kind of linked about uh, who else to engage in this project. Um, one of them says, this project is focused on current teachers. Would you consider doing work with newly qualified teachers and those on their way to become one? And another is about what do you think the influence of parents expecting teachers to be experts um, is and how can that impact? Yeah, well, um, 
I've actually been involved in a, in a lot of work around uh, initial teacher education and um, development um, of their understanding around special education needs in general, so including autism, but, but, but not, not, not restricted to autism. So I do think that it's important that we think about this in terms of teacher education generally. So we need to think about what is it that teachers need to know when they, are begin when when they first go into training, what do they need to know in the first five years um, of teaching, and then perhaps what do they need to know when they're really established. And they may need to know different things at different stages. So again, it comes back to teachers being busy. When they're doing initial teacher education, and again, particularly in England, where we have very short time for initial teacher education. Most of the programs that people do in England are 10 month courses. And there's already a huge amount of things that they have to do and government focus is not, it's actually becoming more on special needs, but there's so many things that the government say, this is what we have to put into initial teacher education. Phonics, for example, is like, has been over the last few years, a really big emphasis of what we should be thinking about in teacher education. There's not that much space for it, and also, when you start doing it, how much can you actually take in? And particularly, until you've had significant experience in the classroom, what is it that's going to be useful for you? So there's all these issues there, that's, um, and it's quite a complicated area to think about what's the right way to approach it, but certainly it's important that we think about it. And the, the second question was about um, par uh, parents thinking that teachers will be experts. Yeah. Um, well... That's a, that's a good question, and I, I agree that there's potentially some, some risk there in that um, if um, parents, if there is some risk that, that, that parents may be set up with a, self, a, a false expectation of what it is that um, teachers can do and, have, and, and what, they're, what they'll be able to help them with. But I think that question comes down to the issue of how we think about teacher, teaching as a profession. So... And partly that comes back to how, long, how much input and how much money we put into training teachers. <coughs> teaching has, is a low-status profession, certainly in much of, the, much of the Western world. It's a very low-status profession. People don't think it's important, which is why the government only is willing to spend the equivalent of 10 months for, for training teachers. Um, but I come back to the point, it's teachers who spend the time with children. They spend the time. They're the ones who are doing the work. Now, we wouldn't ask the same question about doctors. We wouldn't ask the same question about engineers. We wouldn't ask the same question about lawyers. So I would put it the other way, why are we asking that question about teachers? And that's a, a broad societal issue. And part of the thrust of my work is to say, well, Actually, we should be rethinking that, and we should be giving teachers higher status, and we should expect them to have and be able to access the knowledge that is out there in the world, because otherwise, we're failing the children that they're working with. One over there. That's it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I found this really interesting um, meeting. I work as an advisory teacher for autism in Westminster. And I don't know how aware you are of the, the teams of advisory uh, outreach um, professionals going in to support teachers, kind of like a middle layer, perhaps. So hopefully we are um, connecting up with, with the research and disseminating good practice down. So I just think that seems to, to be an important... Um, and I think most of these teams like our own are expanding in London and there is resourcing being put into them. So I think that's an important part of, of what we're trying to do here. And the other thing is the Autism Education Trust, which is a sort of re reasonably new initiative, which is trying to uh, educate teachers, management teachers and, and LSAs in, in um, the best practice and the best ways to support. So I don't know if you have any connection with that uh, organisation and that sort of thing, because I think that's another another branch of trying to, to support and, and use these this, uh, yeah, recent re research and, and, and apply it to schools. So I'm just wondering how much you have had to do with both those areas, advisory teachers and then the AET. Sure. At the same time, jo Joseph, could you comment on interconnectivity, the joined up business yeah, around, uh, around the, the country, if you yeah. can? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, the, the, I think the, the work that advisory teachers do 
is very important. Um, I think the, the work by the Autism Education Trust has, has also been used, very useful, the, the materials that they, that they develop. I think one of the issues that, um, which kind of links both of them is that materials by themselves are, in my view, and I think there's evidence to show this, are quite limited because we've had, particularly in England, if you look at the history in England, if we go back over the, over the last 15 years, government has commissioned many, many projects which have come up with sets of materials and they're all out there online. You can go to the SEND gateway and have a look at them. There's very, very little evidence to suggest that any of that has any impact. So it is by the work of advisory teachers, it's by this type of work where we actually bring it to the teachers and make them engage with it that I think that we need to have development around. So I, but I absolutely agree that advisory teacher work is, is very important. And actually that was part of the element that we had in this project. So the work that we were doing in Phoenix School, they have actually an outreach service in Tower Hamlet. So that actually was part, although I didn't talk about it in detail, that was part of the thing. It'll have to be a lot. Oh, a very quick one, if you should, a quick Just answer. Just a quick observation. I'm on the, the sort of low to medium side. I wasn't diagnosed until I was 28. I'm 55 now. So, what, so I went through school, failed school, and didn't have a very good life until someone realised that it was because I, was aut or I had some autistics that my life started to change. But I wasn't diagnosed until I was 28. So, you know... So it is the fact that people are diagnosed a lot earlier and they're being helped. Thank you. I think that's a comment, yeah. yeah. So uh, that's, that is all we have time for. But thank you very much for your questions and the questions at home. But also a very big thank you um, for a very interesting talk from Joseph. Thank you very much. Thank you.